Despite PETA protests, Texas A&M continues to experiment on dogs for muscular dystrophy research. But what happens when someone with muscular dystrophy loudly objects? The story of Jonathan Byrne, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, Jonathan Byrne traveled for 10 hours by plane from London to Texas just to make his feelings known about dogs being used in muscular dystrophy research. Obviously, growing up with a disability, and I've been through bad times over the years. I've struggled with a lot of things um, physically, uh, with pain, mental health, just coping with the, the difficulties that I've had to face over the years. But in the meantime, I don't want another person or another animal, especially even a dog, to suffer in the process. And I think it's immoral that us as humans are giving these dogs a disease or, you know, canine muscular dystrophy to try and find that research. It's it's wrong to, you know, put an animal that can't st- stand up for themselves to, you know, they can't say, no, this is not right. The 27-year-old Byrne is an avowed animal rights activist who was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy when he was just 18 months old. He's protesting the useless experimentation done on dogs at Texas A&M because he knows there's a better way. I feel like that I shouldn't have to advocate because it should be a moral thing and these things shouldn't actually be happening. But the fact that I am going out of my way to put a voice out there, I don't feel like it's putting me out as such. Um, but obviously, it takes up a massive amount of my time, but I enjoy it because I know for myself I'm making a difference and that's exactly what I want to do. Not just for the animals, but... In this instance, obviously, I'm trying to advocate for other methods of research to be used. And in the long run, if that message is heard, other forms of research is going to be put in place and better cures are going to be found. More on a muscular dystrophy sufferer's compassion for the dogs cruelly used in experiments at Texas A&M, next on the PETA podcast. But first... Thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast. And if you haven't yet, share a link with your friends. Let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. Have you binge listened lately? Begin with Episode 1, where PETA President and Co-Founder Ingrid Newkirk debunks all the myths you've heard about animal rights. And you can also hear Ingrid's words on why mothers on the southern border should have never been separated from their children. That's on episode 24. A cow is a child is an immigrant. Thinking about the law in the Supreme Court lately? Well, listen to PETA's chief counsel talk about how animal rights and civil rights are closely related. That's episode two. And if you want to know more about the Texas A&M experiments on dogs and why they're bogus, check out episode nine, which explains how bad science at Texas A&M only leads to dog cruelty. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. Jonathan Byrne does the best he can. The university student from the UK with muscular dystrophy flew to Texas A&M to protest the cruel experiments being done to dogs who were given a canine form of the disease. He says no animal should suffer for this disease, and more than three decades of these experiments on dogs haven't helped humans at all. Byrne, also known as the Accessible Vegan on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, explains how his activism like his protests at Texas A&M and his adoption of a vegan diet have all been more effective ways of coping with the effects of muscular dystrophy. Jonathan Burns' story on the PETA podcast. Jonathan, so tell me, you've come from England. 
to ask Texas A&M to end its canine muscular dystrophy experiments on dogs. Yeah, and you're, you'll be participating in the protest on Thursday. What do you hope to do on Thursday? Well, basically, we hope to just set up a demonstration uh, to inform others actually what's going on. Um, obviously, you know yourself that they're experimenting on these dogs, and these dogs are suffering greatly just for the name of medicine. But obviously, they're not coming up with anything that's even productive towards supporting those with muscular dystrophy. And although that's not the point, um, I want to put a stop to this because I don't want any animal, especially dogs, to suffer, um, to make myself better or anyone else in my situation better. Now, you have also are doing a billboard ad that will be going up in Texas. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? Well, I was asked by uh, Peter to get involved with the uh, the campaign, and these guys um, asked me if I'd be interested to go on a billboard. And the purpose of this billboard is to basically to show everyone else that this is what we're standing for. We, we want to put an end to the testing. We want to send our message out. And a, a great way to do that is to stick my face on a board saying, not in my name. Tell me, how did you find out about Texas A&M's experiments on dogs? And why do you believe they should end? I know you're very, you feel strongly about it, but why do you believe they, the, the, the experimentation should end? Well, then, Peter actually contacted me via Twitter. Um, I, in the UK, I'm an animal rights activist. I go around um, speaking for the animals. Um, I take part in demonstrations. Um, I've done a lot of work. I'm also a student. Um, I also advocate at uh, slaughterhouses and things like that. I write and tweet all the time about what I'm doing. And I'm also advocate for the disabled. Um, and with that, I obviously use my social media. Not many people with muscular dystrophy are actually vegan or, you know, care enough about animals to you go out and, you know, try and make a difference. And over social media, it's become apparent that I'm a disabled activist who wants to make a better world for the animals. And these guys came in contact with me and informed me that these experiments were taking place. Before that, I had no idea at all. When you found out about it, uh, did it make any sense to you that the, the experiments should be taking place? When I, I, I first saw the footage, and the footage that I saw, was it was awful. I, I saw uh, footage of a dog just laying there in a cage, dribbling and not being able to walk. And I read the article and asked more questions and got in contact. It's, it's apparent that obviously no research is actually productive research has come from this within like nearly three decades. That's a long time for medical research when other forms of medical research are being taken place. It's becoming more progressive, uh, sorry, you know, where they're actually getting the research that they need through other forms. And we live in the 21st century. We don't need these animals to suffer in the process when we have the science and the technology to use other methods. Now, you said you were a vegan activist and you said many people or most people with uh, muscular dystrophy are not vegan, nor are they activists, really. But uh, mm -hmm. you are both vegan and an activist. Why is that? Um, I first went vegan through health reasons, um, because I became very poorly um, with heart complications. I knew becoming having a plant based diet is the most healthiest diet you can have, and I thought I'd give it a go. One of my best friends is vegan herself, and she said to me, "If you want to, you know, go down this route, you need to find." A moral reason to become vegan as well as health reasons i agree because i kind of go through phases of you know trying new things and not working out and i felt like a plant-based diet was probably going to be one of those things so i started watching documentaries and i'm a big animal lover anyway i always have been since i was a small kid through watching these documentaries i just became i just made the connection that you know these animals are animals they they have you know a conscience and they know exactly what's going on they're frightened they're scared and the only people that can stick up for them and make a difference really are you know us do you think that being vegan has made a difference in your health that since going vegan it's made uh, a big difference or do you think that's you know that any kind of improvement has been kind of coincidental um in terms of my health um so with muscular dystrophy it's a progressive disease and for myself um cardiovascular and respiratory are the two main things that can deteriorate quite quickly 
And I've been vegan three years. Before this, my respiratory was becoming quite progressive and the same with my heart. Within a few months of becoming vegan, I had my yearly tests that is mandatory. My results had actually improved. And even over the past three years, they've stabilized and not become progressive. The only thing I've changed in that period of time is my diet. So you can attest that maybe it's been your your vegan diet that has helped you improve your quality of life. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Now, I would think that you know better than almost anybody what it's like to deal with muscular dystrophy, uh, given that you are, uh, you know, battling the disease. But on, Mm -hmm. on the one hand, I can understand that you may not want anyone else to suffer from it. But on the other hand, you must be hoping for an effective treatment or even a cure. Do you think it's wrong to experiment on dogs or do you think it's just bad science? Well, how do you how do you view what's going on at Texas A&M? So for myself, I've obviously grown up with a disability and I've been through a lot of you know bad times over the years. I've struggled with a lot of things um, physically, uh, with pain, mental health, just coping with the, the difficulties that I've had to face over the years. And I know other people in my situation do as well. And of course, I'd like to find a cure for the disability and to find something to you know help myself get better and help others in the same situation as myself. But in the meantime, I don't want another person or another animal, especially even a dog, to suffer in the process. And I think it's immoral that us as humans are giving these dogs a disease or, you know, canine muscular dystrophy to try and find that research. It's it's wrong to, you know, put an animal that can't stand up for themselves to, you know, they can't say, no, this is not right. Tell me more about yourself. When did you find out you had muscular dystrophy? And first of all, how old are you now? You said you're at university right now? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm 27 years old. Um, I study animal science at um, University of East Anglia in the UK. Um, I was diagnosed at 18 months. Um, they knew before that I had a disability, but it just took that long to find a diagnosis. Um, basically, I stopped growing as a child. My muscles just didn't develop. But it was just at a much slower rate than like the regular person. The form of muscular dystrophy I've got, which is Meritin deficient in genital muscular dystrophy, is a very rare form, as opposed to those with uh, like Dujan muscular dystrophy, which is a more common uh, disease. So you got it when you were you got it when you were eighteen months old. Uh, you don't catch it. No, it's, it's a um, it's inherited, so it's passed down. Yeah. All right, but they identified it at eighteen months. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so essentially, you've you've lived all your life with muscular dystrophy. I have indeed. And as I get older, it will progress. And um, in the past few years, like I said, it has the, the progression has slowed down. And I said the only difference to that that I believe is my vegan diet because that's the only changes I've made in my lifestyle. Um, I'd like to believe I'm quite active. I do as much as I can and make the most of my life, which I try and advocate to others and support others to do the same. Um, but there are other people with muscular dystrophy who are much worse off than myself who do struggle. Um, and I do understand that, like, when speaking with these people um, in my home country about the dogs and stuff, it, it, it's a confrontational conversation because these people or some of these people take it personally that I'm trying to advocate to stop the research. And that's not exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to advocate that there's better research, there's better science out there that can help more than testing on dogs that obviously don't have the same DNA structure as what we have. Do you think that? As a person with muscular dystrophy, you have some credibility, or do you think that it will make any difference to the people who insist on these experiments? Do you think that your position as a as someone who suffers from muscular dystrophy makes any difference at all? Not from a science aspect, but from a moral aspect, yes, because I've been through the the suffering myself, so I know that. Obviously, for myself, like if I'm in pain, I can say that I'm, I'm I'm in pain. I need help. I need this put in place and this kind of support. Um, but in terms of these dogs that are being tested on and being given canine muscular dystrophy, they're not able to communicate 
in the same way that we can, and they're not going to be offered the support that like humans can because obviously they're being used for medical research and the primary responsibility for these labs are to get the the figures and the numbers that they need to collect their data. The animal welfare isn't their priority. Yeah, when you hear about that, how does that make you feel about the animals? When you hear this disease is put in their body and they're they're being tested, how does that make you feel as someone who suffers through through all this on a daily basis? It makes me feel kind of a mix of emotions. So when I first found out, I was very angry and upset. Now I'm just really hurt. And I think that's just because I know myself the suffering that I've been through and I still do. And I still have bad days now where I, I feel like, you know, I can't cope with this. I don't want it anymore. And that's normal. But like I was saying earlier, these dogs don't have the same emotions. Well, they do have emotions, but they, they give off their emotions in different aspects, what we can. Uh, and obviously within the lab, that they're in, they're not going to have those needs met, and they don't need to have these, this you know, disability given to them because there are better forms of research out there. Uh, for for those of us who don't really understand what it's like to to have this uh, this condition, describe mm-hmm. your normal day. What is it like? You know, how much pain do you feel, and what do you use to offset whatever you know pain or whatever? you know, this, you know, whatever living with this uh, condition, how do you mm-hmm. offset that? So every day can be completely different. So on a good day, I can be, you know, pain-free. I can go out and be happy. I can go and do my, you know, university work, go out with friends and, you know, live a relatively normal life. But on bad days, muscular dystrophy, obviously, for myself, is a muscle-wasting disease. When my muscles weaken, my joints suffer because I can't move as well. I haven't got the strength to move, so I'm wheelchair-bound all the time. So when it, for yourself, right, if you were to sit in the same position for a long, long time, you'd become achy and stiffy. But for myself, like obviously, this is 24-7. I also have to have help with my personal care, so I have to employ carers or caretakers um, to look after myself. Although for myself, this doesn't bother me as such, like it, but... In reality, it's really a humiliating thing to expect other people to help you with because for yourself, it's a normal thing to just walk to the toilet and do whatever you need to do and leave. But for myself, I have to go and ask if I can use the toilet. I need to ask if I can have a shower. And like these are like obviously personal things to ask for. Obviously, to go out and about, I have to rely on other people to support me. And basically, without other people supporting me and the, you know, the support of my friends and family, those that are paid to look after me, I wouldn't be able to do anything at all. I wouldn't have the life that I have now. So you have caretakers 24 hours a day? I do indeed, yeah. So I employ two people and they live with me one week at a time. And so this is sort of like when people consider long-term care in the United States, you know, and they look at bedding and toileting and eating mm-hmm. and all the, all the, uh, the, the basic functions of human life. I believe there are six that determine whether or not you qualify for assisted living or long-term care. You would be, all six of those uh, activities of daily living would be affected in your case, right? Um, Yeah. I mean, I I don't know how people are assessed here in the States, but in the UK, it's very similar to like what you just described. Um, I can feed myself and things like that, but I need support preparing food and cooking and like obviously living at home like you know the daily cleaning of the house and that sort of thing like for myself i try and do as much as i can um which i advocate to others to do because obviously it encourages independence and mobility and yet it's important for you to i mean you have to endure all these expenses in your care because as well as going through this existence you're also getting medical treatment or what sort of treatment helps you helps helps things or help helps life be better for you or is it pretty much just diet now that's been the major force to to try to to get better or to uh, to to improve the quality of your life okay, so obviously muscular dystrophy is not something you can get better from but obviously the quality of life is something you can improve. So for myself, it would be pain and things like that. Um, I don't take any medications anymore. Um, I found over the years that medication doesn't really help me that much anymore. 
So I just grin and bear and get on with, you know, my daily life as much as I can. For some people, they rely heavily on medication to get over the pain that they suffer. I feel like I'm very, relatively lucky compared to other people in my situation. So if people don't do something like you did in terms of like turning to a vegan diet, they're really just suffering and maybe looking to these dog experiments at Texas A&M for hope. But you, you would say that the hope is somewhat false there at Texas A&M. Totally, yeah. And this has been proven over and over again. Well, Jonathan, I appreciate you taking the time. I know that you've come a long way, and I welcome you to America. When you go to Texas A&M and you participate in the demonstrations, how does it make you feel when you are able to do that, take a stand and be, be an activist? For others to see, and, and I'm talking not just about people who are impacted by by muscular dystrophy, but, but by those who are advocating, you know, for these experiments who, and who see it as hope. How does it make you feel to be out there? Does it make you, does, does it make a difference in your life? I feel like that I shouldn't have to advocate because it should be a moral thing and these things shouldn't actually be happening. But the fact that I am going out of my way to put a voice out there. I don't feel like it's putting me out as such. Um, like obviously, it takes off a massive amount of my time, but I enjoy it because I know for myself I'm making a difference, and that's exactly what I want to do. Not just for the animals, but in this instance, obviously, I'm trying to advocate for other methods of research to be used. And in the long run, if that message is heard, other forms of research is going to be put in place and better cures are going to be found. What does it give you to give you a, a, a burst of life, a burst of energy when you're able to make this kind of difference, when you're able to speak speak up and speak out against things like the Texas A&M uh, experiments? And it does when I hear back from people when they've come back to me and said, thank you for you know spreading this message. It's made a difference to my life. Um, I've listened to what you've said. I want to make these changes. Then, yes, it makes me feel good. When I see animals that have been rescued from these places and you know given a better life, and when I see stats of the use of animals coming down and things like that, yes, like obviously that makes me feel you know amazing. Now, you are a modern day activist in that you have overcome a lot of whatever disabilities you face by going directly online and going on Instagram and Twitter. May, may we share your Instagram and Twitter information with our listeners? You can indeed. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, I'm the Accessible Vegan. Um, and you can follow me on any of those and contact me and ask me any questions you like. And I'm, I pretty much live on social media, so I can, you know, for as much support as I can. And, and Jonathan, can you repeat that again? Accessible Vegan? No, just accessible vegan and on Facebook, Twitter, in, and Instagram. And Instagram, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, is yeah. there anything that you want to do aside from protests while you're here in America? Uh, is there? I know you've been to America before, but uh, you said you've been to New York. But is there anything that? I mean, this is the first time in Texas, right? It sure is. Yes, yeah. a massive passion of mine is to travel. Um, I love to see any places. I've just returned from South Africa for a couple of months. Um, I've just toured South Africa and been to several reserves and had the most incredible time. Been only been to New York um, a few times in the States. So visiting, like, I just love to visit any places. And visiting Texas is something that's never really popped up on my radar before. So while I'm here, I hope to see a few sites and meet a few people and hopefully make a difference while I'm here. I guess you're also living testimony that there is life after muscular dystrophy, that one doesn't have to give up. It's, it's an inspiration in some ways. Or do you, do you see that when, when you're out there through your activism, that the people are affected in that way? And for myself, I don't see it as an inspiration because I see it as something that everybody can do or should be able to do. So for me, I'm just doing what I feel like you know, anybody can do. So that's what I do. Uh, and I try and encourage others in the same situation as myself to, you know, do the best they can do and go out there and just live a normal life that they can for them. 
So really the message is you're not limited. You can take action, you can take a stand, and you could live life. Exactly. And when someone tells me I can't do something, I normally go out there and just do it just to prove them wrong. Well, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, give them hell, I guess. huh? Or, exactly. That's what or, the plan is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you very much yeah, thank you, your sir. time. Jonathan Byrne, thank you very much, and welcome to America. Thank you, sir. Take care. Jonathan Byrne on why he flew from London to Texas to protest the cruel dog experiments at Texas A&M. Byrne is also known as the Accessible Vegan on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can follow our links on our show notes and also take action by going to PETA.org. And that's our show this time. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals in PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.